Temple reading deals with the theme of paying the temple tax, and I suppose a question we ought to ask ourselves is how does this apply to us? In other words, do we pay a temple tax today? And the answer isn't a complete yes, but, but in, in some way we do. But I wanted to draw your attention to a few things in this gospel reading, just to reiterate certain things. So. Um, Peter is not with our Lord when he's asked the question, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And notice that when he comes home, Jesus speaks of it first. In other words, Jesus knew what conversation had taken place, what Peter was being asked. He's indicating that he's God. He's indicating that he knows all things. And in fact, when he says, you know, go to the sea, cast a hook, right? Not a net, but a hook. And the first fish that you catch, when you open his mouth, you will find a coin. Take that and give it to them for you and for me. So the fact that he's able to know that Peter will be able to do this or to arrange that this particular fish that happens to have a coin in its mouth, once again, indicating that he is God. But notice the argument that our Lord is making. You know, the rulers of the earth, who do they collect toll or tribute from, from their children or from others, and obviously from others. They don't collect from their children. And the point our Lord is trying to make is that the temple is the house of God. So it is the place where God the Father is honored, but also God the Son. So he is the Son. So he's exempt from having to pay toll or tribute. He's exempt from having to pay the temple tax because he is God. He is God incarnate. But he understands that they wouldn't understand this, and so he says, so that they don't take offense, go to the sea, catch a fish, and there will be a coin in its mouth, and use that to pay the temple tax for you and for me. So he's indicating all of these things. Now, why did the Jewish people have to pay the temple tax to begin with? Well, obviously for the upkeep of the temple. Just like any structure, any building, it's going to need repairs, it's going to need maintenance, it's going to need cleaning, but also to uh, help pay for the priests of the temple. So they, you know, took part of the sacrifices sometimes for themselves or, or they were able to receive those, but they needed some monetary uh, income also. So all of these things helped not just to maintain the temple, but also the priests of the the temple. And in like manner today, we are required, it's one of the precepts of the church that we help to provide for the needs of the church. And this includes the entire Catholic Church, but also the particular churches that we belong to. In other words, it's through your donations, through your, your weekly contributions to the collection that we are able to pay our bills, to the priest get some sort of salary, to pay our secretary, our lay pastoral associate, and so on and so on, right? So um, it's an important part, it's an important aspect of our faith. It's one of the precepts of the church. Now, what are the precepts of the church? You know, uh, at various times, there were more. Right now, the, if you look at the catechism, it lists five precepts of the Catholic Church. And these five precepts are basically the bare minimum that is required of us to be Catholics in good standing. So the, the one of those is um, to observe Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. In other words, to attend Mass every Sunday and every Holy Day of Obligation. Here in Canada, it's just Christmas and New Year's. Every other big feast falls on a Sunday or we're dispensed. So Sundays and Holy Days. This, the um, second precept is to confess our sins bare minimum once a year around Easter time. Ideally, we do it more often. You know, a good, good um, habit to get into is to confess at least once a month, I would say, for most people. Some people may go more frequently than that, but that's kind of the standard. And the other precept is to receive Holy Communion at least once a year around Easter time. You know, there was a time when Catholics didn't receive Holy Communion every Sunday. And part of the reason was they understood that, you know, our Lord truly present in the Eucharist is so, so holy, and we are so undeserving. It's only, often people would only receive after having gone to confession. Now, I think that was kind of an extreme attitude, but I think it's also an extreme attitude today when everybody receives, 
and not everybody goes to confession, not even once a year, that's certainly an extreme. So I think somewhere in between is the ideal. And sometimes by receiving too frequently, it's kind of like we don't really appreciate the Eucharist as much as we should. The fourth precept is to observe the church's requirements for fasting and days of abstinence. So Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, both days of abstinence, abstinence from meat, but also days of fasting. And every Friday uh, is a day of penance, unless it's, it's a feast or solemnity. So uh, ideally on Fridays we abstain from meat. During the season of Lent, it's actually I think it's mandatory that Catholics abstain from eating meat on Fridays during Lent. Other Fridays of the year, it's still a day of penance, but you are permitted to substitute some other form of penance. You could still abstain from meat as your choice of penance, or you could do some other penance. You might say, okay, on Fridays I'm not going to watch TV, or on Friday I'm going to, you know, do, do an extra rosary that I don't normally do. Something out of the ordinary to make Friday uh, more sacred. As I mentioned, it's the day that our Lord died and he gave his life. We should give something also, and that helps to atone for our sins. It also enables us to have greater self-mastery, greater self-control. So that's four out of the five precepts. And the fifth precept is to provide for the needs of the church. And this providing for the needs of the church, it's not just giving a monetary donation, which in many ways is easy to do. And, and yes, it's important, but it's also providing for the needs of the church. What does the church need? Well, the church needs individuals of holiness. The church needs priests, for example. So praying for vocations, we're, we're helping to provide for the needs of the church. Being involved in the church community, you know, doing things in the church, all of these things help to kind of build up the church. So it, it kind of includes the, the expansion and spread of Holy Mother Church to those around us, you know, making the effort to evangelize, things like that. But the question that sometimes people ask is, you know, in Old Testament times, people had to tithe. Do we as Catholics, do we need to tithe? And that, that's kind of related to the temple tax, you know, there was a certain amount of tax that people had to pay. Um, do we need to to do that when it comes to giving donations to the church? Do we need to tithe? And the answer is no, we don't have to, but some would say it's a good standard or a good model to try to, to attain. But the reason that as Catholics we don't insist on this, I think there was a time when even in the Catholic Church, tithing was kind of mandatory or required, but based on scripture, we see that it's not appropriate to do so. And um, Paul, St. Paul writing to the Corinthians in his first letter, I believe it's chapter 16, verse 2, he says, you know, on, on the Lord's Day, which is the Sunday when you go to church, you know, set aside what you will give. In other words, you decide what you will give, how much you will give. And in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 9, I think it might be verse 16, um, he talks about how um, we have to determine for ourselves what we will give, but we, we are to give not by compulsion, but rather to give with a cheerful heart. If we are to give with compulsion, that means we have to give a certain amount that it's mandatory. And so that's clearly against the scripture. So St. Paul is saying we give not based on compulsion, but freely from the goodness of our heart. And then he goes on to say, whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So he's saying, you know, if we are generous with God, God will be generous with us, but it should come from the heart, not by compulsion. So in other words, we give from the heart, we give out of love, we give out of charity. So something to, to think about, and, and yes, we do have this obligation to support the church. You know, I've encountered some individuals who say, oh, well, I don't want to support this church because I don't like the priest, or I don't like the, the way the archdiocese is doing things, so I'm not going to give uh, my contributions on Sunday. And that's actually a wrong attitude. If you come to church, then you have an obligation to help support the church. If you don't like the priest, well, go to a different parish. 
If you don't like the archdiocese, well, pray for the archdiocese. Pray for the bishop. Do what you can to, you know, make the kingdom of God present here on earth. So it's not just through financial contributions, but as in other ways, as I mentioned. However, if we are receiving the sacraments from the church, then we have an obligation to support our local church, which also means we have an obligation to support the diocese, because it's only through the archbishop or, or the bishop of the diocese that priests are enabled to function. And so we have this obligation to support them, even though we may not like all the policies or, or however, you know, the decisions are made uh, high in, in the higher up uh, level of the church. So, yes, we do have this obligation and we should give, as I mentioned, as St. Paul mentions, not out of compulsion, but freely and generously with a cheerful heart.